Happy to welcome uh, Judge Gabrielle Wolohogin from the Appeals Court, Judge Catherine Hinn from the Appeals Court, formerly of the uh, District Court and Appellate Division, uh, Judge David Barron from the First Circuit Court of Appeals, and Judge Frank Gaziano from the Supreme Judicial Court. Uh, we've been speaking a lot about rules uh, today and the, the new rules, and I'll note that Judge Wolohogin is the chair of the SJC's uh, new Committee on the Rules of Appellate Procedure for Massachusetts, and Judge Gaziano, I know, is chair of the Rules Committee for the SJC that approves all uh, proposed amendments. So, uh, thank you, uh, Justices, for for coming this afternoon. We've, we've been here since noon. Uh, we've been, been uh, engro engrossed in a lot of different topics. Um, but we're all awake and uh, glad you're here. Uh, for, for this panel, what we'd like to do, uh, David and I uh, prepared a couple of questions that we'd like to ask first, and then uh, if you have questions, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take those as well. So, uh, so just to begin, uh, if, you know, and maybe we can just go down the line from, uh, to start with Judge Wellhojan. So uh, should lawyers worry about who the author of the opinion might end up being on the panel, and should they be trying to argue to that person or to any other particular panelist? Um, so, uh, so my view on the first part is, no, you shouldn't worry about who might be the author on, of the opinion, um, because I don't know how you're supposed to figure that out. Um, and so if you dis and, but if you think you are going to try to figure that out and you get it wrong, but you've decided to argue to that person, uh, you know, I, I just think that's going to be a little bit dangerous for you. Um, but should you try to argue to any particular person, I would say uh, yes and no. I, I think on every panel there are people who have uh, more questions or seem uh, more engaged in a particular point or multiple points of the case and and you should listen carefully to that person because the person is if you, if you can satisfy that person um, that per I find for my speaking for myself that when I have questions and they're fully satisfied by the person arguing to me I become that person's spokesperson in the sambal because they, they've gotten into my, they, they've put my mind at ease. So I, I would, uh, but that doesn't mean that when you direct the answer, you're not also directing your answer to the other panelists. It just means pay attention because you do want to, you really do want to answer the person who's concerned. That all sounds right to me. Um, I, you know, it, it, it's particularly tricky, to, I think, to try and figure out who the author of an opinion is going to be, just, just for the reasons that uh, the judge was just saying. I mean, I, I guess you could hazard a guess, but even then, it, it's not obvious what the effectiveness of that strategy is because we comment on the circulated opinions anyway, and there's a pretty high norm of reciprocity in our court, so if uh, another member of the panel's got a concern with a particular approach, the fact that the author of it circulated a draft took a different approach isn't really dispositive of how it's going to come out. I mean, you still do need someone else to join the opinion. So um, I, th I definitely think that's right. And then I think um, just in terms of focusing on any particular judge, I mean, if, if the idea is um, behind the question is something like, I can guess where X judge is likely to go on this case before they've spoken. So I'm going to plan out the argument on a guess based on what they've done in the past. Here's what they're likely to be concerned about. I, mean, I suppose in some circumstances a case could come up in a way in which that judge is just on record enough on an on-point uh, way that you can just expect you're going to get questions of a certain kind. But beyond that circumstance, I think sort of guessing in that way is likely to cause you as much trouble as not. Um, I think the most important thing is to be attentive to whatever is being asked of you at argument. And the fewer preconceptions you have about what they are likely to ask you about, the more likely it is you're going to be able to hear the question for what it actually is, which is what I think you really want to be focused on at argument. I, I agree with everything that's been said. I mean, if you know who the author is, please tell me, because I don't know. 
I mean, we truly, um, I, I, we have five cases, and I usually know which case I don't want to get. Um, and that's the one you get. And that's the one I get. <laughs> so, but we truly in the SJC don't know until the chief assigns the cases at the end ensemble. So it's, it's, it's a mystery. Uh, so you're not going to know that. Um, clearly your job is to craft a well-reasoned argument in brief and try to convince everyone. And then when you get questions, and as uh, Judge Jaholian uh, said, y you get a sense of who's interested and who, who may have written on that topic, and you're trying to gear your well-crafted oral argument to that person or persons, but um, other than that, it, you just has it in a guess, and you may miss the chance to influence the entire panel who's going to have a say in the in the draft and the opinion. And I think that's right. I don't get the same sentiments. Just so that when you have a question directed to you, you need to answer that question and not the question that you wish someone had asked. So to that extent, you need to speak to that person, but not as the author of the opinion specifically for that purpose. I think you need to be persuading the panel. Uh, all right, next question. Uh, do you find charts, graphs, or similar tools to be an effective way to summarize information in the record of an appeal? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you, it, it can be, but um, it, I think people are just differently organized with respect to visual representation versus other forms of uh, conveying knowledge. And I think one uh, thing that I notice, at least in preparation for cases, my clerks will sometimes organize it in a chart or graph, which I find very helpful. But that chart has really been tailored for me. So I don't know how likely it is you'll guess how to do a chart that would be useful to me. Um, but I'm only one person on a panel, and other people, I think, do find that a uh, useful way. You know, I think the, the, the cases of a type that I have found it most helpful are complicated corporate transactions or trust-type cases where it's just, just to figure out the various entities and who's connected to whom, sort of a flow chart in that way. I do usually find it necessary at some point in the case for that to be produced for me just so I can make sure I get what the relationship between the various entities is. There was a, uh, an article that was circulated uh, fairly recently in, in our court on basically how to write to the digital age, right? Because nobody's really reading the mass reports anymore, and the endnotes become way endnotes, the, the footnotes, right? So you're reading them on a tablet, and everybody's doing this, right? So the premise of the article was to write by bullet point, which everybody kind of bristled at. But, I mean, I would take it one step f further. As far as charts or graphs, I've seen some very effective charts in the body of a brief, more so in a 50-state survey where there are particular issues you want to put out. It says Hawaii, Alaska, Montana, and, and you get in that. I thought that was just very accessible and easy to read. I wouldn't recommend it a lot, of, a, a, a heck of a lot, and, and, and advocate for this bullet point, bullet point uh, type advocacy, PowerPoint advocacy, but constructed right with a lot of dense information, it is useful in the record, in, and I would have it in, in, the, in the body of, of your brief. So I like a chart in the appropriate setting, uh, but I would say that with the understanding that the chart is complete, that it's accurate, and that to the extent that it requires references to the record, that those record references are easy to follow so that the chart is meaningful. And I would also say, speaking to those of you who have district court uh, meaning state district court practices, the appellate division is still working on a page count system versus a word count system. So you may want to think carefully about whether the chart is worth the real estate that it occupies <laughs> in your brief. Okay. So uh, when an attorney is writing a brief and is up against the maximum word count or the page limit max, should the writer sacrifice content in the statement of facts or the argument section? No. <laughs> um, uh, you know, my own take on this is that there's a lot of wasted verbiage in most briefs. So you really shouldn't have to sacrifice either to stay within the page limit. Um, the other thing that I would mention is that, and I, I notice this in opinions as well, um, that um, when you're writing your facts, you really don't need to include every fact. Uh, you can put the date that 
everything happened in every sentence for completeness. But if it doesn't matter that it was March 23rd as opposed to March 22nd, why is it there? So just take an eye. It's usually worthwhile after you've written, I find after you've written the argument, to go back to the facts and make sure that what you've told the judges is complete for what they need to, you know, really complete, but isn't getting them bogged down in things they don't really know. And on the arguments, you know, I still find people putting multiple citations for basic propositions of law. That seems to me unnecessary. And, and likewise, not every citation, in my view at least, needs a parenthetical. You know, if, if you're putting the case in for some basic legal principle, like what the standard is in the summary judgment, Thank you. I don't think you really need much more in the parent, or you need a parenthetical if it's just a, a basic legal thing. The parentheticals, I think, are there to <coughs> help elucidate something that the citation, that the sentence that you put in the, in the case um, doesn't show you. So those are places you could trim without trying to sacrifice substance. Yeah, well, my experience of briefs is that the fact sections are usually too long because um, ultimately we're going to be focused on some legal question. Even if it's a factual dispute, it's through the lens of clear error, so it's going to be working through why there's clear error. So um, f for me, the the fact section, I think this is true in opinion writing uh, also. Ideally, it's enough facts just to get oriented to state the legal question that's going to be at issue. And then usually there's a fair amount of procedural history that might be quite relevant to an appellate court to understand why it got here and what posture that I'm in. But then insofar as the facts are relevant in the case, which they often are, it would be in service of the arguments that you're making. And, and that would seem to me the place you'd want to integrate them into your argument, but the, and that would seem like that should give you more room to be advancing uh, an argument. Yeah, I, I would say that there's, there's probably room to, to pair on both the facts and the law. The only caveat on the facts I would give, particular to our practice, is a sufficiency of evidence argument, particularly in a homicide case, because um, we all have cell phone cases and this triangulation and this cell phone and this person and they can get dizzy, in, but in a, in a tight sufficiency case, you're going to need that. Um, so I think you can get the real estate by paring down standards of review and, 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 and doing away with string sites. So this one resonates with me because I could not love a fact more. I could not want to share with you my ever, every single thought and in, in opinion, so I empathize with people writing the briefs. But I think uh, what the other panelists have mentioned goes right to the heart of what you need to focus on, which is be pithy uh, in the facts to the extent that they aren't, they aren't the central factor uh, in the appeal. I mean, I would just add, though, e even when it's a, the fact is important, this is just a bugaboo for me, but even when the fact is important, it's often not that helpful to me to have it appear in the fact section. Because disconnected from the argument that you're making about that fact, when I first encounter it, and I, I don't really know that that fact's going to turn out to be central. You know, it's there. It happened. So it's, I, I find it most helpful when the facts are deployed you know, in connection with what it is you're trying to make me think about that fact, um, which is just hard to do and not right to do in the fact section, usually. How often does the panel or quorum ultimately change its decision or reasoning from when the judges or justices discuss the opinion immediately after oral argument to when the opinion is rendered? Um, it's not infrequent. Um, and that, in, in, in my experience, is, a, is because of one of two things. You know, I think on my court, we're all going to argument um, pretty well prepared. We've read the briefs, we've read the record, um, we've delved into the law to varying degrees. But you really are, 
it's rare that you've gone into everything to the same degree that you will when you're writing the opinion. And when you're writing the opinion, two things can happen. One is something in the record uh, may come out that you either hadn't focused on before or the parties hadn't focused on or something that makes a difference. Or um, your review of the law uh, makes you think about something in a different way. And, and, and those things, they happen. They happen even with the judges who are all smart and have read what the parties put there. We still um, not infrequently find things later on that make us uh, have to adjust. And I don't mean necessarily adjust entirely like it was going to be in a firm and now it's reverse, although it could be, but adjust to some degree. Yeah, I think that's definitely my experience. I mean, I think it's fairly rare that we would actually change the disposition in a dramatic way. We might, it's between vacating and remanding versus reversing, that might change, but to, to, to I mean, it happens, but that, that, that seems more rare to me. But it seems not at all rare that if you had taped our ensemble conversation and then you looked at the opinion, it wouldn't be obvious from ensemble exactly what the rationale that you're reading in the opinion that wasn't expressed with that kind of clarity, which just means, and that's partly, um, I don't know if you agree with it, it's just one of the mysteries of appellate decision making that it works as well as it does because it's, uh, you know, conference can go on for a while, but it's not, I don't know, it's like on your courts, but it can be relatively brief and usually it's unanimous. And then one person goes off with not all that much direction and writes something up that two other people are willing to put their name on. I mean, I'm not willing to put my name on a lot of stuff before I became a judge. Now you're just slapping your name on <laughs> stuff you didn't write every day. But people are able to write it in a way that you're quite comfortable with what they did, even though there's not that much um, direction. It's not like there's an outline of here's how to do it. Um, so it's, it's pretty remarkable that that happens as easily as it does. But I think a consequence of that is that there is a fair amount of discretion given to the authoring judge to figure out a pathway. But the authoring judge is exercising that discretion with an idea of a responsibility to the other two judges to produce something that they'll feel comfortable joining, which means things that are controversial, you're gonna try and steer away from to find something that you know is a way of resolving the case that people can have confidence in. It, it, it does. It does happen on our bench, and I think on tough cases, usually the person who's going to author the opinion. You know, we we go around ensemble and we get a sense of what the majority is, but oftentimes it's couched in terms of, well, that's my view, subject to a deep dive, and the deep dive is going to be in the record, the facts. Um, it could be what other states have done, treatises. Um, the feds, it, it, you know, many, many different factors that take you off into different areas that aren't necessarily reflected in the briefs as well. So nobody feels wedded to that initial um, decision. And I think it's incredibly healthy not to be. I, I, I think um, having an open mind and be able to change your mind is intellectually honest and, and, and something that um, is not discouraged. So for the District Court Appellate Division, I think the outcome is similar to what Justice Gaziano was talking about, although for different reasons, because the Appellate Division does not have uh, uh, any significant amount of staff. There's one exceptional uh, clerk for the entire state who handles all of the soup to nuts filing to reviewing opinions, everything. But there isn't the ability to, for example, have bench memos prepared or do any sort of uh, outsourcing of that kind of information in advance. So although the uh, judges who are sitting on the appellate division have thoroughly reviewed all of the materials before the hearing. Many times the conversation that takes place during the conference after the hearing is sort of adding new ideas from the panelists that had not occurred to the or been raised with the, uh, even the judges who are sitting on that case at that time. So it tends to be a very changeable, uh, sketching out the broad outlines during the conversation, but how the decision ultimately gets to the goal that's uh, that's set in that conversation can change dramatically during the time that it's being written. Sure. I, I would also say that um, at least in the past, 
11 or 12 years since I've been on, on my court. Uh, I think culturally we've shifted a little bit so that it used to be more that the author would go off with the case and do all of her own work and then if you know it turned out that couldn't reach the result that people had talked about in Sambal would, would only then you know alert the other two panelists usually with a draft that came out the other way and now uh, on my court there's much more of a culture of actually resembling the case when the author comes up against uh, something that they think is a significant roadblock that would matter to the other two judges and and um, and and uh, something that Judge Barron said really resonated with me which is if the author really is taking seriously the notion that they're writing for the panel you know two other people are going to have to sign on to this then it becomes very easy when you're doing that to think, oh, you know, John and Mark are going to want to know about this because, and I should tell them early on. And sometimes it's just they lay it all out in an email, and I say, look, here's what's happening, and this adds a decision, a decision point that we hadn't addressed. And I'm thinking this, I'm thinking that. I'd like to know what you think. Can we talk? And we do. Okay. So David and I have uh, some more questions, but. I be nice to open it up if you have any questions. So, are there any questions? Back. Yeah, uh, we just heard about the value of concise statements of fact. Do you think there's ever an opportunity where saying that the facts are simply not relevant if it's a jury selection issue or a jurisdictional issue and simply omitting what facts or what you like to see some presentation? If I have to write a decision, I'd rather you take a cut at it first. So a little, uh, you know, a few pages would be nice. I, I wouldn't, you know, because we're going to have to write something, right? So um, just give us a little bit. That's what would be my response. <laughs> I mean, I think some cases there, there's just a certain amount of facts that are necessary to just situate why this legal issue is arising, but, but not necessarily more than that. You know, if it's a federal drug offense, and the issue is ultimately going to turn on the something having to do with the sentencing guideline uh, provision and interpretation of that provision, a detailed account of the, let's say it's about loss arising out of a fraud or something. It may not be that important to describe the conspiracy in any great detail if it's going to turn on just some discrete fact about the loss question, right? I just don't see the need for an extended account of it. And I, I don't, but I do find in briefs there is a sense that maybe it's just because there's something called facts that's a section that people feel like they've got to fill it up but you know you can if it's short it's still a section right but but to your point though I mean it, it just because it's an SJC brief it doesn't have to be 50 pages <laughs> so if you give me a 25 30 page brief that's r really focused that's much appreciated <laughs> want to get yet another judge's opinion or uh, an, an outside opinion, not outside opinion, you don't call it Yale or Harvard, but do you ever bring in other judges who are not on the panel to consult with you? I mean, I, maybe this is uh, most applicable to the appeals court because we have 25 judges and three panel judge, and uh, panels of three. And the answer to that is, um, is yes in a global sense with modifiers. So as you know, we're a court of general jurisdiction. We see everything under the sun. And there is no person who comes onto the, our court with uh, experience in anything more than some pretty small subset of the cases that we hear. And um, I do a lot of mentoring of our new judges, and what I tell them is, you're the judge, and you need to work through the case yourself. There's a lot of help here among the other judges, but it's your responsibility to really figure out the hard case outside your area of expertise by doing the hard work to educate yourself. But then, it would be silly 
not to go talk to someone who practiced in the land court or someone who practiced in the juvenile court or someone who practiced in the district court. And I think or probate court, you know, these specialty courts where just the practice alone is so sort of specific to the court that when we write and we don't run it by a person who is really versed in that court, we often make mistakes because, uh, and they can range from small things like it's not called a complaint, it's called a petition, to practice things like, of course, you know, someone will say, well, no one ever moves for such a thing because this other thing would have happened first. So yes, but I also believe that people, well, you all know that we circulate our published opinions to all 25. That can have an effect on the um, the outcome of the case, you know that. But I, I don't believe that going to another judge, a single only judge on our court should have an, an outcome on at odds with what the panel was thinking. It's a piece of information to help the panel. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good question how to think about it. There, we, we're small, so in fact, we once upon a time, but there were only three of us. So there was no one else to go to. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but even now, we're only six active judges. So we have obviously senior judges that sit with us, and there's a number of them. But I wouldn't say, if I just have a reflection, I mean, certainly we talk about our cases to each other, but I don't really recall instances of going to another judge for help, particularly maybe in a couple instances. I'd say that the, in the back of my mind, I have a certain hesitancy about it, just because I think the advocates, I mean, you are arguing to the judges you're arguing to on that panel, and, um, you know, that's a special relationship that's developed between the litigants and the panel. And so some other actor who wasn't part of that, and I think this is just what you're getting at about having some dispositive influence would be sort of counter to the whole enterprise um, at some level. But at the same time, you know, we are a court and there are people with a lot of knowledge and expertise and many wonderful things about being a judge, having lots of people to talk to is not one of them. So <laughs> an opportunity to talk to someone about what you're working on, there, you know, there is a value in that at the same time. We, we, yeah, yeah, we don't have that problem. Have that. <laughs> <laughs> For better or worse, <laughs> we don't have that problem. Did you have a question? I think it's more an observation or a, uh, that, you know, given the um, exponential pace of technology and time, like, I feel like, like, between the time something, a crime occurred, I don't know, criminal practice occurred. technology that arose like it. And I guess, I know, I think of, um, you know, trying to change the court as an institution in terms of its precedent, it's sort of like a giant cruiser, and a, a giant tanker, and it's, it's sort of this very slow kind of glacier that you're trying to get it over. And um, as far as you're faced with, you know, lot of hard cases these days, I guess. There's a lot of hard that the precedent has just does not no longer can fit the facts that are now arising. And and how do you how how does one I mean I know there's just a way there's this crime didn't occur and this the elements as they're now presenting and even though it's just a pretty awful thing to happen. But I guess that must create a tremendous tension. but one that we know most of what we do won't be reviewed, so you know, we take that seriously because we want to get it right. Um, I, I think it's in the face of technology, 
analogy, we're trying to, our decisions, you're not wrong. We are like a slow moving tanker because we're always trying to make only the incremental decision necessary for the case in front of us. And, 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 and so that may not address like the entire technological issue that is out there, but we're always trying to do the most narrow thing and wait for the next case to come. And, and I think what you'll see is if, if someone feels really differently about that, they split off. So, um, so like, I don't know how closely you follow these things, but like, you know, GPS has been a big thing for us and, you know, I split off on that and, and the case could have been, you know what I'm saying, and the majority went in a much more, you know, slow pace. So I think that's how you'll see it playing out. But generally, there's a inclination to just take it step by step, and also to draw from by analogy to the to previous technologies that we have more cases on. It, it, we, we see it all the time in in, in the technology parts of that that um, you know the, the GPS world where where you feel like you're in a time warp pre-Augustine, right? So we're, doing, we're dealing with murder cases that happened in the, you know, thousands and such, and, 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 uh, and, and, and police that had different rules, and then, and then what, what our present rules are now. We see it in two seventy eight a cases on the, on the post-conviction forensic testing where, you know, technology at the time you get a case has been frozen, and then you know from another case it's at a different point as well. And I think we're aware of that, um, but you have to decide the case that's in front of you at, at this point with that record. I mean, you, 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 we do, we do um, you know, when I was a trial lawyer, we would impanel in, in the um, jury room, right? So I don't know if people date back to, with no jury, with nobody present, um, things, body yeah. emotions in the judge's lobby. Um, Sometimes you get cases on, on motions for new trial where they're doing just that, and that was the way trials were conducted back then. And you feel, yeah, you are in a time warp sometimes, but I think you have to decide the case in front of you and, um, and, and try to catch up that way. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the expectation of privacy cases are particularly difficult in that way, and, but I think one um, dynamic that just contributes to the difficulty that of moving fast on these things is that the it'll come up in a particular case that particular um, advocate is not always perfectly positioned <laughs> to tee up that issue for you with the kind of depth and I don't blame the advocate I mean it's a mess of a case it's one issue in it um, that advocate doesn't have particular expertise in that question either. It just happened to arise in their case. They spotted it. But you can see it, and you see that it's pressing on a pretty big societal question about what are, is an expectation of privacy with respect to that new internet technology. Um, but it, it's hard not to think as a judge, gee, am I really well positioned in this case to resolve that question well? Um, I think that's a, a big contributing factor to it. So if every case came to us like Carpenter came to the Supreme Court, where it was perfectly teed up and everybody interested in that topic got to weigh in over the course of a year to present it, well, you know, then you would be well positioned to say something quite thoughtful about it. But that's not how those cases come up, even when the issue's there. And I think, but you know, that particular defendant is no less entitled than the defendant in Carpenter to have their Fourth Amendment right protected. So I think that's a real challenge. It's, it's just the realities of litigation and how that plays out. Okay, question in the back.
Yeah, it's been an express topic of, of conversation, and the opinion is don't do it. Right, and, and there's obviously a diff distinction between the facts versus um, social science research, right? So I think that's that's something that. Um, but yeah, if 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 you have an issue about a, a brain injury that was litigated, you can't start typing away and and becoming you know it, that that's and that's expressly prohibited, right? Um, but as, as far as you know, um, you know identification issues and the like. That's as you see from our court, you see it quite often. There, there are citations to uh, to, to internet research and, and, and scholarly art articles. One last question for anyone. Okay. Oh, there's. Okay. Hopefully, a mechanical question. Hopefully, a little simpler than some of the others, perhaps. Um, in a situation where. You were talking earlier about how much of the facts you actually need. In terms of the supporting data that you would put into the record appendix, if, if a point is a fairly simple point, um, so for example, that the other side didn't argue something in particular, uh, and it's, it's the only way to prove that is to throw in the trial briefs or the hearing at a, at a transcript of the hearing, but the point is a fairly minor point. The judge has gone off sort of in a different direction which is the real issue on appeal. Is it necessary to, to include in the record appendix where you want to see in the record appendix something to prove the negative? In other words, all of the documents that would be necessary to show this issue wasn't raised, which might be 100 pages of argument? It, it depends, right? So if you're saying that they, it wasn't preserved in the argument on the motion to suppress, right, or, or in a sidebar? summary judgment question on a court case. Um, the, the, the Whitaker decision says, for example, that the, the court will address the question of foreseeability either as a question of duty or as a question of proximate cause. And in the submissions of the parties to the trial court, it was addressed as a question of duty. The trial court decided to handle it as a question of proximate cause. And there is some, some difference in the way that that actually might play out. Would it be important to put in to the record appendix the, the briefs of the parties to show that, in fact, the parties handled it one way, the court handled it a completely different way? I, I think any point you're trying to make, if you can make it easier for us to get your way to put it in the record appendix. I mean, because if I have to go through an entire transcript to get your point, I'll do it if I have to. But if you cite me to a, a provision of the record appendix, and because the, the reality is, and, 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 and it's short sure for the appeals court, I don't know about the First Circuit, everything's digital, right? So you're not lugging in, or we aren't. Everything's on our iPad, so we're zipping through stuff. So it's very searchable now. So it makes it a lot user-friendly for record appendix. So if you say, look at pages 50 to 105, you won't, I think that's, better than the entire transcript, right, and in, in having to go through. So I would focus us and make it user friendly to the extent you can. But is the difficulty you're imagining a case where you say they never did something? Right. So then I've got to put every page that ever was related to the case to show they never did it. That would be the extreme version of what you're worried about. Yeah, I, I don't think you need to do that. But I think you've got to also be sensitive that if you're trying to make an argument that hinges on showing something wasn't done, how are you going to demonstrate that it wasn't done? I mean, I take the point, but um, I think it's usually in practice there's ways to handle that sort of and I've seen filing the, everything. Yeah, and in the summary judgment, it's usually they didn't argue. Yeah. So give us the argument, right? four volumes of stuff. So I don't know whether the court this case 
or I've changed, or whether it's just put everything in and give it to you. I just think it's more persuasive to put the correct stuff chronologically, docket sheet, et cetera, in the record appendix. Your point's a little different, but I mean, does something change, or should the record appendix be lean and mean? So the rule is, at least for us, that you need to put the motion in. You should combine that with the rule that says the motion needs to state the grounds. So that should solve the waiver question, because if someone is actually, the two-page motion should say, I'm moving for summary judgment on the following grounds, five grounds. And then you don't need, the rule also says, don't include the memorandum of law and support. Unfortunately, people aren't doing the motions correctly, so then you get the problem of, well, how am I going to prove this point of waiver or that estoppel, the person said this below or the person didn't say that below. And so then they put in the memoranda. And I don't really know any way to get around that, except to say, please put the grounds in the motion, and then you don't need to include the memoranda. It would also, I mean, in my fantasy future world, we're going to have hyperlinks, so you can help us by putting it in the table of contents, and it just goes straight there. I think our, it's still very hard for us to navigate these huge, you know, 800-page documents that are on our iPads. We can bookmark them, which we do, or at least, you know, I think most of us do, to the relevant spots, so we can jump back and forth. But, so, it's not like the technology now makes it so easy that we don't mind if you put the kitchen sink in the appendix. But I do think you need to put everything in that you anticipate might make a difference to us, whether it's on waiver or actual substance. I mean, in theory, there's another party interested in your assertion that they waived it. So they would have some incentive to put in the document in the materials showing that they didn't, if they didn't. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Justices, for the afternoon.